Welcome everybody to our event. Uh, today is Earth Day and I would like to start with a sense of gratitude. Um, gratitude for life and gratitude for our home Earth. Our event today is called Restoring Our Relationship with Earth, an educational approach to a new civilization. I want to thank all of you who are joining us today from different parts of the world and those of you who are actually in different time zones, early in, very early in the morning or very late in the evening, I want to thank those of you joining us from Africa, from Asia, Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, and express my appreciation for each one of you for willing to join us today. This webinar is organized by the Earth Charter International in collaboration with uh, the Pachamama Alliance, uh, Earth Charter Friends uh, in the Netherlands, and the University for Peace, where we are located here in Costa Rica. The thing that brings us together today is at the heart of our work as uh, UNESCO Chair on Education for Sustainable Development with Earth Charter. For the past several years, our commitment and work on training and research has led us to uh, find or look for different ways to bring sustainability and especially sustainability values into education in a way that it is transformative. Our work specifically seeks to strengthen the capacity of educators to incorporate the values of sustainability that are articulated in their shatter in educational processes. Our work also focuses in engaging, empowering, and training young leaders to be or to become ethical leaders with the commitment to the sustainability vision that is broad uh, and that puts life uh, at the center of its vision. I'm Miriam Villela. I'm the executive director of the Earth Charter International that is located here in Costa Rica, and I'll be moderating the event today. So today, as we know, is, is a special day that millions of people around the world um, are celebrating the Earth Day. And it is going on for over 50 years. And, and for the past 50 years, it has become, I think, a growing, growing movement. And, and it's a, certainly a major moment for the environment movement to raise awareness with regards to our connection with Earth and with regards to our dependence on planet Earth. It's certainly a day for us to pause and reflect about what it means, uh, life on Earth, to pause and reflect about what, what it really means to live in balance uh, with life support systems and in balance with Earth. It's a day for us to expand our consciousness uh, on the importance to see Earth as our home. And in the fact that we need to respect and care for Earth and life and all diversity of life that is in Earth. But actually we could say that every day is Earth Day. Uh, given that this is our home and we live in our home every day. And we say every day because it's not just once a week, not just once a month, uh, not even once a year, that we need the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. It's actually every day. And so when we are able to turn our conscience into action, we'll naturally, I would say, respect Earth in life in all its diversity, as it is articulated in the first principle of the Earth Charter. Uh, what's, what do we need to do to roll up our leaves, our sleeves, uh, to restore our Earth? What do we need to do to, to make, to put that into action, that idea of restore our Earth, which is the theme for Earth Day this year? I would like to invite you to think that in order to make that happen, the idea of restore our earth, we need to start restoring our relationship with earth. And for that, we need a new approach to education. So to stimulate our thinking about this, we have two very special guests that are joining us today. Um, 
and who have been working on these issues for decades, Satish Kumar and Lynn Twist. Satish is the co-founder of the Schumacher College, as well as the Resurgence Trust in the UK. He has developed or devote many projects, but has mostly devoted his life to campaigning for ecological regeneration, social justice, and spiritual fulfillment. We also have the honor of having Lynn Twist here with us, who is co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance based in the US, and also co-founder of the Soul of the Money Institute. For years, Lynn has been committed uh, to working and committed working uh, in supporting efforts in different fields of social justice and environmental sustainability. So thank you for both of you who are jo joining us here today. So I would like to start the first question and invite Lynn to come to the floor. And it has to do with education. And the question is, if we are to restore our Earth, and our relationship with Earth, along with addressing the challenges of current times. What is the kind of education that is needed? Lynn. Well, first of all, thank you, Marian. And um, I'm so delighted to be part of this uh, conversation, particularly delighted to be uh, in conversation with Satish Kumar, who I love very much. Uh, and who um, I've learned a great deal from, as has as have we all. And um, it is the 51st Earth Day uh, here in the United States where I live. Our president uh, is moving um, the dial today uh, quite substantially. I just want to mention that and honor that. He's called the leaders of 40 countries to a Earth Day uh, summit. And um, it's quite a uh, reversal from our previous administration. I'm sure everyone can see that pretty clearly. And it shows how things can, how fast things can ch uh, change and turn around. Um, and I think that's a, a powerful part of what we need to educate uh, young people and all of ourselves about. We can turn things around and we can turn things around fast that when we shift our, our worldview, when we shift our way of seeing, when we recontextualize, reframe, re-see, respect, regenerate, revitalize, rethink, uh, everything shows up differently. And in many ways, the pandemic that we've all been, uh, uh, we've not got all the way through it, but we've been through a year of uh, a kind of intervention that the indigenous peoples of the Amazon uh, that we work with have said is an announcement, which is a very uh, powerful way to talk about it, I think. They call it an announcement from the mother, uh, everything comes from the earth, including the virus, uh, about uh, that really um, intervening in uh, our species uh, in such a way that we can rethink the course we're on. So when you ask about education, I think Transformational education is absolutely key in today's world to transform worldviews, to transform ways of seeing, to um, the word respect, uh, the etymology of that is respectate, relook, re-see. Uh, it might be uh, another way of saying wake up, rethink, reimagine the world. And um, I would say that our um, our young people and people in at all levels of, of formal education also need to be um, educated uh, with emotional intelligence that uh, deepens their relatedness to one another, to the community of life, to all species, and to the earth herself. Um, I know there's huge studies and it's a huge field of emotional intelligence, but it hasn't made its way into formal education in a prominent way in a way that I think we need it now at this time in the evolution of humankind. And also um, we need to be educated on how to cope, how to cope with what's here, what's coming uh, in a way that our focus is not on survival, but our focus, our own personal survival, but as our focus is on evolution, transformation uh, and dealing with what's showing up. Um, and I love the term restore, uh, restoration. I love the term regenerate. 
I love a new term that's being coined by the Buckminster Fuller Institute, regenerosity. Um, uh, these are qualities, uh, human qualities, that I think need to be central to education uh, for this time in, in what we're facing as a human community. But it's all based, in my view, in relationships. As you said when you opened, um, I'm so grateful to you for calling this uh, event together and for the Earth Charter. Uh, finally, I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Satish, he'll say amazing things, because uh, he always does. Uh, every single human being on Earth should be educated with the Earth Charter. That is really critical. So thank you. Thank you, Lean. Uh, that's wonderful to hear you. And uh, thank you for emphasizing the importance of relationship. Indeed, um, an idea that is uh, very strongly uh, emphasized in the Earth Charter is the importance for us to look at how we, we relate to others, how we relate to ourselves, with our inner selves. How do we relate with other people and other lives in the large living world? So it's kind of expanding our consciousness in terms of how we relate, how we ought to relate and figuring out ways to, to improve our relationship to one another in the large living world, the community of life as uh, it is articulated in their chatter. Thank you. So that, Satish, Considering the challenges of climate change, the challenges of current times of social injustice, considering the importance and the need for us to restore our earth and our relationship with earth, what do you think is the, the kind of education that is needed for the current times? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Miriam, and thank you, Lynn, for your very kind words. And it's my pleasure too to, to uh, be on this platform together with you. <clears throat> um, I would like to say two things uh, to answer your question. First of all, relationship. Reality is not made of objects. The reality is made of relationship between objects and subjects. As uh, famously, Thomas Berry said that the universe is not a collection of objects, but it's a communion of subjects. So what we need to bring in our education is this idea that reality is not isolated, disconnected, separate items or objects. So objective study has to be eliminated out of schools, out of universities, out of colleges. No objective study because objects don't exist. Objects exist only in relationship to each other. So that is the first fundamental change, revolution and transformation we need in our educational system. That everything is interrelated. Everything is interconnected. Everything is interdependent. There's nothing stands isolated, separate by itself. Nothing, not even this desk, not even this computer. Nothing exists by itself. Everything exists. So we exist in relationship with the earth altogether. That's one point. The second point I would like to change in educational system is means and ends. At the moment in our educational system, we are taught the young people are taught that nature is a resource for the economy. I think that is a fundamental mistake of educational system. Nature is not a resource for the economy. Nature is a source of life itself. So that must change. At the moment, our, our object is that nature is a resource for the economy. Economy is the end goal, economic growth production, consumption, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, profit, um, all the development, all these things are the end. And then nature is the means to an end. This is the educational system at the moment. Use nature, exploit nature. Nature is a resource, use it, exploit it, steal the secrets of nature for the human benefit. And not even for the human benefit, 
but for the small number of one or two or five percent of big corporations and big business and big industry. So second, humans are also have been taught as a, you are a resource for the economy. Humans are no longer uh, the, the end goal. Humans are also human resources, we call them. In our business, if you go into our industry, you go um, in our any kind of um, uh, kind of enterprise, you go. They say human resources. Humans are not resources. Economy is a resource. A production consumption is a means to an end. The end is well-being of the planet Earth, integrity of the Earth. So if we change that into our education, it has to be a revolution. At the moment, our young people are trained, educated, almost brainwashed to go out and use nature and use people to make economy grow. Economy has become the religion in education. Economy has become the God in our education. I think we have to dismiss that God and that religion. And true religion is religion of nature. My religion is nature. My family is nature. Earth is my family. Earth is my home, as you said, Miriam. Cosmos is my country. Earth is my home. Nature is my family, like the American Indians, the Pachamama, and the, the Latin American Indians, and the Adivasis, the, and the indigenous people have always said, that mother earth, father sky, the uh, winged um, uh, birds and the uh, two-leg animals, uh, four-leg animals, two-leg humans, they're all members of one family. So nature is our family. That has to be part of education. And love is our religion. Religion is not Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or Jainism or Hinduism or any other ism. Love is our religion. And then all other religions are fine, diversity of expressions, they're all honored and respected and celebrated, but true religion is love. So cosmos is our country, earth is our home, nature is our family, and love is our religion. This can become the part of our curriculum. And then all the subjects are interrelated. Ecology, economy must go together. Politics and, and earth charter should go together. Everything is interrelated. We have put educational compartments and departments separate, separate and, and disconnected. So that separation has to end and relationship has to come back. So all subjects are interrelated. At the moment, our students are taught economy without teaching ecology. Economy means management of ecosystem or economy means, ecos means home, management of household. And ecology means knowledge of household. But no university teaches ecology properly. Ecology has been exiled out of universities. Ecology and study of understanding of earth and nature has been exiled out of universities, only as a means to an end. So this is the second point I would like to make, is that trans transfer, what are the means and what are the ends? Nature is not a means, nature is not a resource, humans are not a means, humans are not a resource, they are the end. And the economy, production, consumption, profit, business, industry, politics, all these are the means to enhance the well-being and health of the planet Earth and well-being and health of all living beings, including human beings. And then we can celebrate the diversity of humanity and diversity of animals and plants and forests and rivers and oceans. We can celebrate the diversity rather than create divisions and conflicts and wars. So that's a fundamental change of attitude and fundamental change of philosophy in our educational system. So educational system present time, all our universities and schools and colleges are out of date because these universities were built and designed to uphold the industrial age. And that's gone. Now we are entering the age of ecology, the age of environment, the age of the earth where we realize that if we don't take care of the earth with the global warming, the climate change, the coronavirus, all these things are showing us that the age of industry and age of economy has gone. And now we are entering the new era, a new age, new time. And for that time, we need a new kind of education. The education at this moment is out of date. They are brainwashing 
our young people to think that nature is a resource, humans are resource, we have to make money and making money is a wealth. Money is not wealth. All our business schools and, and business academies have to learn that money is not wealth. I mean, mm. um, um, uh, uh, Lynn has been raising funds for us all for our environmental movement, but money is a means to an end. The end is to serve the earth and the humanity. And money is a good, good thing. Money is a good thing. If we, it is a means to an end, but money becomes a bad thing, it becomes the end and humans and nature become the means. That's the mm. transformation I would like to see in our education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sachish. And I think we all, or certainly I will agree fully with you that uh, we need the transformation. We need a revolution in the way in which we approach education. And uh, that's one of the key uh, or central uh, idea of the work we do here. And we have been scratching our head and, and thinking or exploring ways to, to really make it happen in the education system, how to transform education system, how to transform the way education is done in a way that it relates to, to these current challenges. Um, there is a saying here in Costa Rica that says there is no cacao without, there is no chocolate without cacao. Yeah. There is no chocolate without, without cacao. So there is no <laughs> new civilization. There is no civilization with, a, with a ecological literacy without an education that really reflects that. Um, exactly. So... My, my second question, I would like to invite you, Satish, to come first. Um, and it has to do with transformative learning. Um, we, we agree that there is a problem with the current education system. It, it's not coherent with, uh, with basics of ecological literacy. It's not coherent in, in terms of how we ought to relate with, with Earth and with one another. And therefore, how, how to make transformative learning happen? The question is, what are the keys of transformative learning? Um, yeah. Especially what are the, what's that kind of learning or education experience that is needed to take our civilization to a new stage, to that stage that, uh, that we can, we think about restoring our connection and our relationship with earth. Now, we know that we, you are launching a new book that has to do with transformative learning. And if you could uh, share with us just a few of the keys for transformative learning to happen. Yes. Uh, the big transformation, a revolutionary change, will not come from the center of power. <clears throat> Harvard and Yale and Oxford and Cambridge and all the big, big universities, they have a vested interest in the established order. And so change will not come from there. So change has to come from the fringes. This is why we, the people, you and I, all of us here, and Earth Charter, and many, many other uh, ecologically minded people, we have to start new educational experiments. This is why we started Schumacher College, <clears throat> where we say it's not education of just brain, when students go to universities, they think the students have no body. Students have no body. They have only head, only brain, and they educate only the brain. At Schumacher College, we say students have body. So let's have education of head, education of hearts, education of hands. And, and students are not isolated individuals. They are connected with community. So let's have education in the community. And, and education has to be practiced. So ecology is not just an intellectual theory, it's a lived experience. And so we say, how do we live ecologically in our educational process when we are being educated? So uh, cooking together, gardening together, um, washing up together, walking together, uh, going out in nature together, learning from nature. We say the human teachers are fine, but they ultimately, Nature is our greatest teacher. Nature is our true mentor. So we take our students to Dartmoor, to, to wild places in the, in the, uh, by the sea or, or in the fields and, and, and experience nature. 
So this kind of change will come from the many, many, many hundreds of thousands of small, small, small um, new centers, new educational uh, experiments. And then they will impact Harvard and Yale and, 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 uh, and the University of Beijing or University of New Delhi or, or Paris or Cambridge mm -hmm. or Oxford. They will be later. They will not be the leaders because they have vested interest in the old out of date education. They will hold on to it as long as they can because they, they don't want to lose their power. So we have to create a grassroots movement around the world. And mm -hmm. Schumacher College and our book, Transformative Learning, tells you about holistic science, holistic Gaia theory, deep ecology, um, holistic economics. All these ideas are there and they will have to come uh, in experience of people at a grassroots level. And I would like to see hundreds and hundreds of no, thousands of small, small, small Schumacher College types of colleges starting around the mm -hmm. world. Then the big center will cannot hold. Center <laughs> cannot hold. They will, they will fall down and they will collapse and the new will be ready to take over. That's my okay. vision. <laughs> Thank you, Satish. And I must say that when we established our Earth Charter Center on Education for Sustainability here over, 20, over 15 years ago, I looked at the Schumacher College as, yes. uh, as an inspiration, uh, was, was certainly an inspiration to the work we do here on, on the campus of the University for Peace. We have a beautiful, forest just next to our center and we we do take people out outside uh, yeah. to to start thinking about connecting with nature not just from a theoretical perspective but from an experiential learning yeah and, and also and, seeing nature as our teacher sure yes now lynn uh could you share with us some highlights of the experience uh, of the Pachamama Alliance in terms of transformative learning? What do you think are the keys to make that happen? Well, we, uh, first of all, I just love everything that you're saying, Satish. It's just, uh, it's like being back at Schumacher College just to hear you speak. Um, I, I, I wanna say that the Pachamama Alliance has um, been given such a gift because we were really sourced by the indigenous people of the Amazon. And the indigenous people of the Amazon in the part of the Amazon uh, that we call the sacred headwaters of the Amazon, and they call the sacred headwaters at the base of the Andes, the very dynamic part of the rainforest that actually is the source of the whole Amazon system, which in many ways is the source of our climate. So we were called, invited to go to the source of the source, you might say. And this um, southern Ecuador and northern Peru, uh, 70, 75 million acres at the base of the Andes, where the waters from the Andes are very dynamic and um, they come out of these active volcanoes and really source the whole Amazon system. Um, and so the people who live there are the people who really uh, initiated the Pachamama Alliance in, in, in partnership with my husband, Bill, and uh, John Perkins and myself. And um, having that be our source, our origin, is uh is has been such a, a privilege such a blessing because the view the way that indigenous people see the world as satish uh referenced is they don't see themselves separate from nature it's not like they live in the rainforest they are of the forest the forest to the plants the animals the insects the snakes the the birds the 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 leaves the trees the 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 fungus is a brother and sisters part of the community of life for them and they hold themselves accountable for the spirit of life uh for uh, maintaining the spirit of life so from there the pachamama alliance created our educational programs from that insight from that whole set of of uh, ways of looking at the world and also i'm i'm thrilled to hear the words thomas berry because thomas berry and his work the universe story became a very important source also for our educational programs, which is called the Awakening the Dreamer program. Uh, and then that has sourced or created the Game Changer Intensive. Uh, and uh, also the next program that we offered, um, which came out of the Drawdown book uh, that uh, Paul Hawk and one of our greatest allies wrote, uh, the Drawdown Reversing Global Warming. And now we're, uh, pr we also have what's called the Action Training. But all of this, comes from a, 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 a worldview, a, a understanding 
that we are in a total communion with nature. We're to in total communion with nature and with one another. So the mission uh, and vision of the Pachamama Alliance curriculum is very much like what everything that <laughs> Satish is saying. Uh, and our uh, educational curriculum is delivered in 88 countries by volunteers, it just in people's ho houses, in churches, in, um, in, in basements, in companies. Now, not now because people are not gathering, so everything's online, but it is in community that we learn. Uh, it is in community, in conversation, in relatedness, in talking to one another, in realizing things that we didn't ever see before, in having like a, a complete shift in our relationship with everything. And the, um, the educational programs of the Pachamama Alliance are transformational educational programs. Uh, we, we're very careful to, to put that word in there because uh, it, it really is about um, bringing forth an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet as the guiding principle of our times. And I'll say that again, this is our mission, to bring forth an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet as the guiding principle of our time. And it comes from the very first encounter with our indigenous partners. Uh, and there's a famous uh, quote, indigenous quote, if you're coming to help us, don't waste your time. If you're coming because you know your liberation is bound up with ours, then let's work together. We took that, that advice very seriously. And they told us, thank you for coming to us. We invited you here to uh, educate us about the modern world so we can actually have a relationship with the modern world that doesn't destroy us. But also, we invite you to go home and do the real work, which is change the dream of the modern world. That's how they put it, change the dream of the modern world. They really say you can't change your everyday actions permanently. They will start to line up with what your dream is for yourself. You, but you can change the dream and that will come back and inform your everyday action. So exactly what uh, Satish said, you know, and it's also we can quote our wonderful Greta Thunberg when she says that uh, it's a fairy tale to have in infinite growth on a finite planet. This dream of infinite growth, we need to change that great dream. That's just a, it's a fairy tale. It's impossible. It's destroying us. So we need to change our dream, what we're aiming for, what we want. And as Satish puts so beautifully, the well-being of the earth, the well-being of the community of life, the well-being of life itself is the dream to bring forth. And if that's the commitment you have, then it changes your everyday action. But if your commitment is grow at all costs, uh, at the expense of everything else, that sort of you or me mentality, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, then you take actions consistent with that dream, you know, to be on top, to win, to defeat, to be the victor. Uh, but if your dream or your commitment or where you're coming from and where you're headed is the well-being of the earth, the well-being of the community of life, the well-being of yourselves, your family and everything alive, that informs the way you act. So the, um, the Pachamama Alliance educational, transformational educational programs, which are delivered all over the world, are really about shifting, changing, transforming the dream of the modern world to a dream that guides us uh, to, uh, to, to what we really want. And we all really want this and we know it. Not more money, not more stuff, uh, but the well-being of the planet, the well-being of future generations, the well-being of all children of all species for all times, as Bill McKibben would say, and to live in a way uh, that ennobles our life, knowing that we can live the most meaningful lives any generation of humankind has ever lived, because the choices we make impact the future, future of life for the next 1,000 years. And when you know that, when you feel that in your body, when you're educated to realize that's who you are now, and you're so lucky to be alive, so fortunate to be alive at a time when our decisions, our choices make that kind of an impact, it ennobles your life. It gives you the access to the greatness that everybody's longing for in their heart. Hmm. Thank you so Wonderful. much, Lynn. Wonderful. Yeah, so it seems that the connection with nature and the way we see it, um, our worldviews is key to how we can stimulate this through education. Um, a lot of our work has to do also with, uh, with, 
with looking and questioning our assumptions and our worldviews, how we connect, and how we relate to nature and how to include that in education processes. Now, the Earth Shatter mentions, uh, ha has a specific sentence that is highly quoted actually from the, its preamble. And it says, we must realize that when basic needs have been met, human development is primarily about being more, not having more. Mm -hmm. So how can we stimulate being more rather than having more? <clears throat> Cultivate that. Um, of course, Lean, uh, uh, you have uh, written a book about the soul of the money. Uh, Satish has also been working a lot on, on issues about, I would say, being more. Um, Satish, could I ask you to come to the floor and share what do you think about that sentence? Um, we must realize when basic needs have been met, human I development that, is that really sentence, about being more. That sentence deserves to be quoted and quoted and quoted again, like a mantra. <laughs> um, we are human beings. We are not human havings. But our, this industrial society has turned us into human havings and we have forgotten that we are human beings. And so being more and having less is the key to sustainability. And there is a wonderful book by Eric Fromm called To Have or To Be. And when you want to have something, you are possessive, acquisitive, egotistical, selfish, all the self-centered, because you want to have, have, have. And when you don't know how much is enough, however much you have, never enough. So America is the number one economy in the world. And yet America doesn't know that we have en they have enough. Um, Europe is second or third economy in the world after maybe China. And yet Europe doesn't know that we have enough. Now let us share with other people. And, and let's be more. So when you are being, then you develop non-material aspects of your life. Poetry, music, dance, painting, friendship, family, literature, poetry, all these things develop. Gardening, cooking, all those things develop because we have time for that. When you want to have, 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 you have no time for dancing or for meditation, for singing, for music, for for poetry, uh, for family and friends, because you are busy nine to five every day, working, working, working to earn more money, to have more, to have more, to have big house, to have big car, having, having, having. So we have to transform our education from the idea of having more to being more. I think that's a key passage of the Earth Charter. And I think that should become a mantra for everybody. And when we are talking about this transformation, transformative learning. And as you mentioned, that we have this book, uh, Transformative Learning, uh, well, celebrating the 30th anniversary of Schumacher College. That transformation is this transformation from, from idea of having to idea of being. Even in our relationship, if I want to have a friend, I may not have them. But if I want to be a friend, I will have lots of friends because I am a friend. So be a friend rather than try to have a friend. Even try, trying to have a lover, you will never find a good lover because you are always trying to have a lover. But if you want to be a lover, you will find a good lovers because you are being yourself. So not even, even in material possessions, but even a spiritual way, in a psychological way, Eric Fromm talks about being more and having less. Be a father, be a mother, be a friend. Then you will have a good son, good daughter, a good friend. Be a good husband, you will have a good wife. But if you want to have a good wife, you will never have a good wife because you are too egotistical. So I don't want to have a good wife. I want to be a good husband and let mm -hmm. my wife decide what she wants to be. So having is the curse of our modern civilization. And and our advertising world is forcing people to desire more without needing it. 
Mahatma Gandhi said, like Alf Chata, Mahatma Gandhi said, there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but not enough for anybody's greed. And having is a greed and being is a need. And so nature is abundant. There's no, no shortage of anything. You plant one single seed of apple and that one single seed can give you thousands and thousands of apples of 50 years. So abundance of nature is there. There's no shortage of everything, anything. The rain comes, the sun comes, the, the forests are there. Everything is growing. Nature is abundant. But our greed and our possessiveness to have, to have, to have, we have turned nature, which is abundant, into, um, uh, into shortage. It, because we are counting everything. How many apples are there? And they are not enough. Um, so in the supermarket, you package them in plastic. You turn abundance into scarcity. So that's the kind of problem of having. Havingness transforms abundance into scarcity and being transforms scarcity into abundance. Therefore, let us bring being into our education and not having into our education. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Satish. <laughs> How can we cultivate that more? Uh, this idea of being more and not having more. Mm. Lean. But we have to cultivate by our example to start with. We have to be ourselves. You and I and all of those who are uh, in this consciousness, we have to be the example. We have to be the change mm -hmm. that we want to see in the world. So like a radiator radiates heat to warm the room, we have to radiate that beingness in ourselves. And, and then we bring that into our education. And our teachers have to teach our young people to be more and not want more, not have more, but be more, because they have everything. Our young people have imagination. Our young people have courage. Our young people have heart and love in their heart. And our young people have compassion in their heart, like Greta Thunberg, like um, uh, Amanda Gorman in the United States. Amanda Gorman's poem, when she read the, uh, the poem at the inauguration of Joe Biden's presidency, that was a poem of being. Mm -hmm. and a wonderful example of being. And, and so if we can have Amanda Gorman and Greta Thunberg, these people uh, being that conscious, our young generation is ready for it. It's the older generation has to transform ourselves. Sure. Thank you, Satish. I do think that the, the teenagers in the youth of our times um, are very much... Uh, affected by what they receive through movies, through social media, through news. Not only their parents, not only their teachers, but through everything they receive throughout the day that shape the way they see the world. Unfortunately, the urban society uh, are not necessarily seeing nature and either the connection of nature but seeing a lot of uh, things that have to do with cultivating the need of having more. Um, yeah, and and yeah. I think it's important for us to realize that the fact is uh, that mainstream society, uh, it's really very, the driving force is having more. Um, and therefore it is important for us to realize that it, it is of course important, but it is a challenge for us to, to, to make that idea uh, that is clearly articulated in the preamble of their shadow of being more than having more, articulating it in such a way that it sparks the interest of teenagers and young people broadly. Lynn, uh, would you share with us your thoughts on how can we further cultivate that thought? Well, this is my favorite topic, <laughs> so thank you for asking. And Satish, thank you for your, your beautiful you know, you're such a beautiful example of being, you practically jump through the screen. You're so, your energy is so uh, in, in, incredible. So I just have to acknowledge it. It's just amazing that you're in your eighties and you are the most energetic person in the whole world, I think. Thank you. Uh, I learned, I'll, I'll just say that I learned a lot of what I know about or what I experienced about this topic from Buckminster Fuller, who I was so fortunate to know. Uh, and Buckminster Fuller really, um, uh, at, at, in a very poignant moment, 
in a talk he gave uh, during the Integrity Day uh, talks he gave all over the planet in 1976. He, um, he looked out at an audience of 2,000 people, of which I was one, and he had a, 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 a utility table in front of him, uh, you know, kind of a, a big table with these, uh, these models on it, uh, a tetrahedron, an icosahedron, and he was talking about the intellectual integrity of the universe. And frankly, I didn't quite follow what he was talking about, but Buckminster Fuller, who was often called Bucky, he was so lovable. He was like you, Satish. He was, he was in his 80s. He was full of energy. He was like, you know, everybody's favorite grandpa. And everything he said was rooted in love, just like the way you are. And you Thank remind you. me of him so much. And, um, and I loved Buckminster Fuller. I loved him. I loved everything about him. And that at a certain point in this presentation I'm referencing, he, he, it, I had a transformation there. Uh, and I want to share it because he walked out in front of this utility table looked straight at the audience and said, now I'm gonna say the most important thing I've ever said or perhaps ever will say. And I remember when he gave that headline, I thought I'm gonna understand this. I sat up in my chair, I got my antenna fully uh, in receptor mode. And he said, and this is 1976 now, he said, humanity has crossed a critical threshold and put his arm out like this. Yeah. And that threshold is this. We are doing so much more with so much less. This is 1976. Our science, our innovation, our genius is in the direction of doing so much more and so much less. We are inventing in a way that we will have so much more with so much less that we clearly live in a world where there is enough for everyone everywhere to have a healthy and productive life. Perhaps we always have, he said, but clearly now that is the world in which we live. So we go from a world where it's a you or me world, where you make it at my expense, because there's not enough for both of us, to across this line to a world where there's enough for everyone everywhere to have a healthy and productive life, which is a you and me world, where you and I can both make it at no one's expense. And this transformation from a you or me way of seeing the world to a you and me way of seeing the world is such a profound shift in our relationship with one another and with the community of life that it will transform absolutely everything, he said. But then he said, this experience of enough, this experience of sufficiency being met by the universe with exactly what we need, maybe not what we want, but what we need, even sometimes something we don't want, but we need, like a divorce or a bankruptcy or a cancer diagnosis that makes us realize the preciousness of life, etc. But getting exactly what we need and having the world be a world where there's enough, this term of enough, and he said sufficiency, not abundance, sufficiency, and I'll talk about abundance in a moment, is a total game changer. But he said in 1976, we won't realize it for about 50 years, he predicted, because all the institutions of humankind, education, governance, clearly the economy, and he named all the big institutions of humankind, and then he even said religion, is rooted in a you or me understanding in the world, a scarcity mentality that really believes there's not enough to go around and someone somewhere is always going to be left out. So your job is to accumulate as much as you can for you and yours, even if it's at, even if it's at the expense of those who've been left out. And you'll help them later when you have way more than you need in a charitable way. But first you need to get more than you need because you have to take care of you and yours because there's not enough to go around and someone's going to be left out. That mentality he said, will reign for about 50 more years because all our institutions are rooted in that understanding of the world, that misunderstanding of the world. Then he said, in about 50 years, things will become so dysfunctional. Our institutions will become so dysfunctional that we won't be able to fix them any longer, prop them up, repair them. We will need to let them fall apart and we will need to recreate them 
from a whole new paradigm, a you and me understanding of the world, a, a, a world, a, a, an understanding of what I call the radical surprising truth of enough or sufficiency. And that radical surprising truth uh, will be a new way of seeing the world and will generate institutions that are you and me institutions consistent with the actual truth of the world. And then out of that, we will live in a completely different way. So I that this is about 50 mm. years ago that he said this. Mm. We are now in a in a in a time where it's clear our institutions are falling apart around us. They are dysfunctional. As you say, education's propping up all the old systems. And the job now for all of us, I think, is to hospice the natural death of the structures and systems that no longer serve us with some respect some gratitude for what they gave us while we midwife the birth of the new structures and systems that will now serve humanity because we know what that means now and we're coming from a a context of sufficiency of enough that we know how to produce more we're, we've mastered that we don't need to master that anymore we have enough and from the portal of enough not from the portal of more we discover overflowing abundance that abundance actually is sourced by the appreciation, the gratitude, the recognition of enough. And when that experience of enough happens to us, when you know you have, you are sufficient, you are enough, you not only have enough, but you be enough. All you want to do is give and serve and contribute and make a difference with your life. It shifts your entire way of being. So I say that we're in a um, in a huge, epic transformational moment that um, what Bucky said 50 years ago is now happening. And this time in history from 2020 to 2030, this is the decisive turning point decade. I'll also say um, something that I, I, I it's not exactly part of the question, but I'm going to add it anyway, that uh, it's time for the feminine to rise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there is a beautiful prophecy um, from the Baha'i people that says, and I, I just want to say this because I think it's so important and it's part of this, uh, this new context that's emerging, um, that, that they say that in the 21st century, the Baha'i people prophesied that, that um, and this is also uh, from the Cherokee people, that, that there's the bird of humanity, the bird of humanity has two great wings, a male wing and a female wing. And the male wing has been fully extended, fully expressed for centuries, while the female wing of the bird of humanity has been truncated, folded in, not yet fully expressed, not yet fully uh, functioning. And the male wing, in order to keep the bird of humanity afloat, has become overdeveloped, over muscular, and in fact, violent. And the bird of humanity has been flying in circles for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. When in the 21st century, the female wing in all of us will fully extend itself and the male wing will then be able to relax in all of us and the bird of humanity for the first time in hundreds of years will soar. And in many, many ways, this wing, this male wing in all of us is this drive to produce more, 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 to provide, provide, provide. And the feminine wing is the wing of, 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 of actually being, of, of, of the kind of depth of relatedness of spiritual uh connection of knowing who we are it's it's the heart and the mind almost the mind and the heart of humanity coming together so that we can fly with the male wing and the female wing in balance and there's something about that that's that's also part of this when you mention amanda gorman i'll mention malala i'll mention greta thunberg these three young women if i think of them they're icons for a new way of seeing the world um, they are the heroines of this younger generation. Um, and they are speaking from a context that's different than the context I grew up in. And um, one other thing from Buckminster Fuller that, um, that was so important to me, um, in one of the encounters uh, my husband Bill and I had with Bucky at our home, uh, he, he had dinner with us in the kitchen with our children. And one of our children said a, a, a beautiful kid thing, you know, how children do, just beautiful, profound, uh, 
one of those jewels that comes out of a child. Our, our daughter Summer was eight at the time. And after this profound um, childlike uh, moment, Bucky turned to Bill and myself and he said, never forget your children are your elders in universe time. Mm -hmm. They've come into a more complete, more evolved universe than you can ever really understand except through their eyes. And when I heard Amanda Gorman speak, when I listened to Malala, when I listened to Greta and others and my grandchildren, um, I realized there is the evolutionary um, power is at work in who we are. And we are in this epic moment of realizing we have enough, but we also, more importantly, we are enough. We are enough. We don't need to live in a deficit relationship with ourselves or, or in a deficit relationship with the world. We are enough. And from being enough, all you want to do is give and serve and share. And that's the source of true prosperity, true well-being, true wealth, uh, true abundance. Hmm. Thank you, Thank you. Lynn. Wonderful. Great. So I would like to start bringing in some of the voice or questions or comments from our audience. Um, I, I would like to read first, uh, we have a message or a comment from uh, Chris Beener, who is joining us from Florida. He's a professor at the college there. And he says, many of, this, many of the youth of our time tell me that they want to look at the world differently and interact differently, but they see no hope because the institutions still reward greed and consumption. Would any of you would like to comment on this comment from Chris Beener? The institutions rewarding greed and consumptions. Well, I think uh, uh, Satish has already talked about that. I mean, the big universities, that uh, that have so much prestige come from the status quo. They have to to stay alive. So um, we need to, you know, know that that is not only what is put forward, but it is it's now the false god. It is the false religion. It is what Satish was calling, you know, the religion of our time. And um, we all of us need to stop rewarding the rewarders. <laughs> You know, we need to uh, find our way to speak and listen to the voices that are the voices of the future, the voices of the unborn, the voices of of the kind of um, um, uh, energetic field that indigenous people have been inhabiting for so long and have held on with such um, with such fierce a commitment uh, to guide us through this sort of wormhole we're in. Um, and uh, and I don't know, I'm sure Satish has something to say about this, but I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't define us. Every transformational change um, has come from off stage, has come from the wings. <laughs> you yeah. know, you think about the end of the Soviet Union and the falling of the Berlin Wall and the end of apartheid. Uh, you know, it didn't start with governments and big companies and, and, and the media. It started somewhere very small and very behind the scenes and under the radar. Um, but eventually, uh, that's where everything starts. So as, as Satish says, look off stage, you know, don't look at what's on stage, look at what's off stage. Uh, and, and, and that's where we can find uh, the long term future. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with that. The young people are the hope. They don't have to look for hope, as Lynn said, in the established order, because that established order is of yesterday's order. And we are looking for the world of tomorrow. And the young people around the world, when this um, um, Friday for the Future movement started, people, young people of 12, 13, 14, 15 uh, year old were marching around the world my granddaughter, who is 11, she came to me and said, uh, Grandpa, do you have any book by Greta Thunberg? 11 years old. And she said to me, I want to volunteer to plant some trees. Can you take me somewhere? So I said, yes. And I took her to Dartmoor. Uh, there's a uh, tree planting uh, organization. 
and then she went she wrote to the to the council and said council i want to come and meet you what are you doing for the earth she's 11 year old so hope is young people themselves they mm. don't have to look for hope uh, in the established order of government of media of business or industry they are not going to give them hope they are themselves are the hope so recognize mm. your strength and build the new world which we need and the young people are going to do that i yes. can see thank you uh, my mother often tells me when i get stuck with something she says look at another window <laughs> Yes. from another viewpoint so it, yeah. it is exactly. a good thing so thank you so much let me read two questions that came from youtube one is from joan anderson who's joining us from japan and she says um it's so symbolic that greet greta uh, began with a strike against the formal education system and the question is how can we create new spaces where children can develop this sense of interconnectedness uh, and thus covid present new opportunities for that. Uh, what do you think of that? And then there is a question from Kathy Fitzgerald, um, who I think is joining us from Ireland. It's a question for Satish. Can other experiments in education in other parts of the world link with uh, the Schumacher College? Satish, yes. would you like to comment on both? I can uh, comment on the second one, and then Lynn can maybe comment on the first one. Yes, many, many people from Schumacher College, after spending a, 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 a year there or few, six months there, they go back to their own countries. And now we have Schumacher College type of um, educational experiments in India, in Brazil, in Colombia, in, um, in Japan, in China, many, many countries are starting. And we always say, when students leave Schumacher College, I say to them, don't go and look for a job. Don't look for an employment. Create your own job and create a new center of education or new center of activism, which will create a new, new world, new ecological, spiritual, socially just, all the three things which Lynn mentioned. So create something new. And this is what many young people do when they go out of Shibaka College back in the world. They don't go and look for a job and find employment and, and get good salary and that's a success. They are creating new experiments, particularly in Brazil, for example, two or three such, a, uh, uh, such initiatives are taking place. So I think uh, this is the way, and as Lynn said, uh, I agree with that. This is the way when grassroots people from the bottom up start to build a new alternative world, then the mainstream will listen and change. So this is how apartheid uh, came to an end, the Berlin Wall came to an end. When Martin Luther King started, he didn't start from the center. He started from bus boycott in, in, a, in a small town in, in Georgia. And, and Mahatma Gandhi started the spinning wheel. So all the big, great movements, have, women's movement, how did that start? Women's movement started from very small, small uh, beginnings, like, um, uh, like um, Simone de Beauvoir wrote uh, a book, second, The Second Sex, in the kind of 40s and 50s. At that time, the place of women was very um, neglected and very kind of ignored. And women were not respected for their imagination and creativity. They were looked down. Um, now things have changed. So all the great changes and transformation happen. Um, so Srimakha College is very much part of that. Uh, and, and transformative learning, and the book tells you all the people who have done those things in other countries. Lynn, over to you, first question. Thank you so much, Satish. Um, I'll, I'll just say creating spaces for children to express themselves, I think is actually happening. and. Uh, the, the person who asked the question said, has the pandemic somehow or COVID uh, presented opportunities? And I, I, that's a very provocative question. I appreciate it. I, I'm just thinking about my grandchildren. So I have five grandchildren. Uh, three of them are in college in on, online. I mean, they would go to college if they could. Um, and they're home with their family. And then um, uh, the two younger ones are nine and 11. And they are able to go to school now part time. And then they do a lot of their work online. 
And I've noticed that one of the things that it's created is it's forced um, all of us as parents and grandparents in a good way to spend a lot more time with our kids and to learn from them, to listen to them, to, um, to serve them, <laughs> to mm. care for them, to pay attention to them. And prior to the pandemic, um, you know, parents and grandparents, including myself, were hither and yon, you know, changing the world, et cetera, in a way that's often at the expense of our own families. And the pandemic gave us uh, a lot of terrible, terrible tragedies and, um, and challenges. It also is feedback, though. It is feedback, just like global warming is feedback, powerful feedback. Um, and the feedback that the pandemic is, is, is stay home. Stay home and reclaim your home, reclaim your family, reclaim your relationship with those who are closest to you. Um, uh, don't have it just be some place where you land and leave and land and leave. Have it be the place where you actually live. So I say the um, the the COVID has really given us a an experience, a new experience of our own children, a new experience of our own grandchildren, and the wisdom that they are carrying, and hopefully. Uh, we've been able to affirm them so that when they can um, move out into the community, into, into, into school again, um, they feel more, um, more connected to their parents and more connected to the source of life. Mm -hmm. uh, that may or may not be true, but I, I, I hope for that. I pray for that. In addition, this thing about the internet, I don't want to step over how significant digital uh, is now. I, I say this, I like to say the more digital we get, the more ritual we need. For me, ritual is really important now. And the digital world and people being um, educated online, having their friends online, seeing their families online, having life like what we're doing right now, online on a screen. There's a lot of horrendous drawbacks to that. On the other hand, the relatedness and interconnectedness that this technology provides for us, which is like the myce mycelium uh, that is part of the you know, natural world, has, uh, has allowed our children, who are better at it than we are, I'll just say certainly for myself, um, and have grown up, uh, are growing up in a world, a digital world where they have access to all the information that ever was, have access to each other in ways that I didn't have uh, when I was growing up or didn't, don't even have that competently now. Uh, there's something about that that I think we can uh, nourish. Uh, and, there, and there's a lot of bad stuff too, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not putting that aside, but I'm putting it over to the side for the moment, that we can nourish about the interconnected nature of life that is validated, affirmed, and strengthened by the digital uh, uh, world that we're in for our young people uh, so that children, their sense of interconnectedness and interconnectedness, which is natural to them, can be affirmed by the digital world. So uh, those are just some thoughts. I really don't know the answer to that question, but I really love the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, there's a question from Silvia Ferrero, uh, who is joining us from YouTube. Uh, I think Silvia is based in the UK. She asked you, can you share the source of that prophecy or the story you shared on the birds and, and humanity? The source well, of the story. Thank you for that question. I wish I could be really uh, eloquent about the source of this or accurate. Uh, hopefully I'm eloquent about the, the prophecy itself. I feel like I'm a carrier for that prophecy. Uh, I thought it came from the Cherokee. Uh, because I have a friend, Rebecca Adamson, who I heard that from in the very first time I ever heard it, and she's Cherokee. But when I was trying to research it, I couldn't find any Cherokee sources. And now I'm told that it comes from the Baha'i people, the Baha'i religion, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that the that. Cherokee people picked it up. Uh, but I think it comes from the Baha'i people. And it is a prophecy about the 21st century, which I am naming, you know, and maybe other people do too, the Sophia century. This, the 21st century, the Sophia century, the century when women will find our rightful role in co-equal partnership with men and the world will come into balance. 
and the Sophia century, the hundred year cycle, the first hundred years of the third millennium. If you think of it that way, we're only 21 years into the third millennium. And we are learning very, 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 very fast about the consequences of the way we've been living that's inconsistent with the future of the human family and inconsistent with the future of life. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that sounds slow, but it might be fast in the long view. Uh, if you look at the first hundred years of the third millennium, and if you look at it from the way I'm looking at it as the Sophia century, the century when wisdom will take its proper role in, in, um, in communion with knowledge and information, uh, the mind and the heart will begin to rejoin rather than the mind overpowering the heart. The heart may be lead in, the, in this uh, 21st century. The Sophia century when we'll tap into ancient wisdom, knowing that it's as powerful as modern world knowledge, uh, and we'll start to live from the wholeness of the heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn. May I invite Alide Rurik, who's joining us from the Netherlands, to come to the floor and share her comments and Hello. questions. Hello. Thank Hi, you, Alide. Miriam. Well, thank you really very much, Satish Kumar and Lynn, for your beautiful contributions. I really enjoy it. We say hello from the Netherlands. We also celebrate Earth Day here. It's become a ritual in the Netherlands because it's um, springtime to uh, do an act on Earth Day in the Netherlands. At, it's sowing uh, seeds for the bees and uh, which it need to be organic. First people thought anything would go, but now everybody understands it should be organic seeds for the wild bees and the honeybees to survive. Because of course we are in a big crisis in the Netherlands. We have big loss of biodiversity, uh, deforestation, and we contribute with a very large footprint to deforestation in other parts of the world and, and other problems. So we feel very responsible for the crisis we are in. I would like to say something to Satish. Satish, my daughter, Ayla, has been in Schumacher College. You were her teacher. I do see what you mean. You awakened something in her to say that don't pick a job, but create something. And she did that. She also says that's why all these Schumacher students who come home never earn any money because they're all in, she's in the filmmaking uh, uh, industry now. And uh, so she says that the downside is that we are not that powerful yet because we all take our creative jobs or activities. And uh, so she regrets that at the same time, but I do see the value. Thank you very much. And then she yeah. came home. But you know, all the yeah. great, uh, great um, uh, people who have contributed, Van Gogh died poor. He I didn't... know, I know. <laughs> and, and Jesus Christ died poor. Uh, he know. didn't make any money. And many great um, people who have made a great contribution to the world, uh, they I have know. not been rich, but they have the richness of creativity, the imagination, the service, yes. the love. That's a real wealth. So if your daughter is not making money, but making beautiful films and making yes. good contribution to the world, she will be remembered for many, many years after <laughs> she has gone. So please yes. tell her that- I will uh, tell her. her I'm in her house right now and I will tell her. Um, she took your book home, your book called Earth Pilgrim. Yes. And I read it and I was so impressed. It showed me that your mother you walked with your mother every day. She took her to her land, to her plot that, of land. And yes. then you said, why don't we take this car or this charter that came by? And then she said, no, every step to the land is important for me. And you kept walking your whole life. You did yes. thousands of kilometers and you, you walked for peace. You walked yes. to Washington, you walked to Moscow. I That's really right. respect that. And you yes. did it without any money. That's the right. last day when you left, you I, decided I, to do it without money. <laughs> for two and a half years, when I walked from India to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington, Tokyo, Hiroshima, for two and a half years, 8,000 miles, not a penny in my pocket. All the time, 
I was depending on the hospitality of the strangers, help from the strangers. And now I have written a book about it called uh, Pilgrimage for Peace. Uh, uh -huh. It's a, a long walk from India to Washington. And so you can do things without money. Money is only a means to an end. The real thing is your heart, your imagination, your creativity, uh, and your, your courage, and your enthusiasm. All those yeah. things are as important. And then money comes later. I know. And then connected to education, I wanted to come back to your mother, because I think this example in your early, in your early childhood, to have an example of somebody who embodies the, another relationship with Earth. Yes. And uh, I think that is maybe the most powerful thing that can happen to you in your life when you have people around you who do restore the relation with Earth or feel that they are the daughter and sons yeah. of Earth and are good as they are. We yeah. talked about that. We I, all feel we short. As, huh? as, as Lynn said, the yes. age of Sophia, the century of Sophia, my mm. mother was my teacher. And... And I mean, I've met many, many people, including Martin Luther King, Bertrand Russell, um, and many, many other people, Bangari Mathai, many people I have met. And my mother was not famous, but she was my hero. And I think every mother is a hero. Every mother brings that love and that heart uh, to the child. And so uh, my mother was a great example for me. And I've written about her in many of my books, including Earth Pilgrim, You Are There For I Am, No Destination, in many of my books. I praise, because she was my great teacher. So every mother is a hero for me. But my mm. mother was a true hero for me. So mm. the age yeah. of Sophia started from my childhood. So I, I would like to say to everybody here in the Zoom and the YouTube, I've seen more than 100 participants in YouTube, that's great, that let us try to be this example. Whether you're yeah. a mother, a father, brother, sister, Try to be this in your daily life, because I think that is the strongest message. And it's difficult sometimes, and there are dilemmas. I also see children who are raised in cities who have no access to green or nature. How can they relate to nature in a good way? Uh, let's try and you know provide such an example. And maybe then uh, this can help rebuild the institutions. I'm so agree so much with Lynn. We need to re-energize and rebuild other institutions because we need them. We cannot just do it as individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's um, finish with the last sentence of the Earth Charter here, the joyful celebration of life. If we feel it in our heart and we find this creativity, then, well, maybe another person is infected as well. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Alide, and thank you for you and all our Earth Chatter Dutch friends. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful network, uh, very much alive and active um, in, in the Netherlands. Let me bring in a comment slash question from Professor Anupan Sarap, who is joining us from Pune, India. Uh, thank you, Anupan, for being here. And he says, the dream of our world has been in the economy. As we point, pointed out, you, you pointed out here, the dream has been GDP in the have, in the you and me. Uh, how can we dream about planetary well-being instead of national haves? How can we move to recognition of the whole through the Earth Charter to recognize our contributions to planetary well-being? Uh, maybe Lynn, would you like to? to make a comment on that and then Satish? Um, well, uh, I recommend the Awakening the Dreamer program uh, at the Pachamama Alliance. It's really about changing the dream of the modern world, like really seriously about that. And um, um, and it's a kind of um, experience, experiential emotional education that has you uh, shaken from uh, the the current dream, which is a trance, actually. It's a trance, not a dream um, that we're caught in, the consumer trance. And um, and I, I, I th this question or this comment really gives me the opportunity to tell you, Satish, I, I just really want to tell you this before we end. I will never forget something you said um, when you were on a panel with Jeffrey Sachs and Deepak Chopra. And I was there 
and um, you and I knew each other from from uh, Schumacher, but I was just in the audience. I wasn't on the on the stage. And um, and Deepak asked uh, Jeffrey Sachs and you about poverty. And Jeffrey Sachs had just written one of his you know wonderful books about poverty. And you said it was just a showstopper. You said poverty is not the problem. Poverty is okay. It's wealth that's the problem. Wealth is the problem. And that I, I can't remember what else you said, but it just went bong into my soul, into my heart. And um, when the, uh, Alide from um, the Netherlands spoke, I realized that's the place where Amsterdam is experimenting with donut economics, a new economic system that is not about wealth, not about accumulation. It's about being where no one falls through the middle of the donut uh, and nobody acquires so much wealth that they go outside of what the, the ecosystem of the earth and the ecosystem of the human family and the community of life can tolerate, that no one amasses huge fortunes. And to me, that's so egregious now that we would allow people, no one wants that. I mean, we, th we think we want that kind of wealth, but you know, I, I have the great privilege actually of working with some of our wealthiest families who are so burdened and confused by the way they're treated and the magnitude and the burden of that kind of money is 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 so unhealthy it's a kind of um a material obesity that crushes the human spirit um and so this um this thing about the pursuit of wealth in terms of financial resources is such a uh uh it's so off. I, I don't really know how to how to use the proper words. We need to uh, shift from that being anybody's goal, really, uh, to, to just let go of that and uh, money not being the end, but but money being a useful means to be of service to humanity, yes. to the community, to the well-being of life, which is a very, very, very significant and huge transformation. However, transformation takes place like that. When, when something shifts, it shifts big time. In the United States, we've just seen with the murder of George Floyd, I'm gonna bring it to this, this call because we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos of police brutality that people saw until they saw that one video, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, things did not change. And something about it's, a, it's an idea whose time has come. And that was the turning point. And yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, the verdict for the person who uh, was the police officer who was a misguided uh, person and who ended up uh, killing George Floyd was um, uh, convicted on three counts guilty. And that's another turning point. It's not just an event. It's a sea change. And you can feel it in my country. You can feel it in people's hearts. You can feel it. It doesn't mean we don't have work to do, but there are moments of sea change. And I invite all of us to know that there's an idea whose time has come now with the way we're living. And we know we're off course. Everybody knows it. Even people who've amassed billions of dollars, they know. I've worked with some of them. They know it's not right. And so we have a window now, and it's not just a window uh, of we have to do something or it'll be too late. Yes, that's true. Uh, but that kind of generates fear. We have a window of opportunity. We have a window, we have an aperture now. And when you speak, Satish, I hear you, here you are in your 80s speaking from the future, bringing the future to us today, creating an idea whose time has come, which is a phrase from Victor Hugo that we used often and quoted in The Hunger Project, where I used to work. Um, there's moments when an idea whose time has come and you can cause an idea who's and cause an idea's time to come with your intentionality, with your integrity, and with most of all with your love, not with your fear, but with your love. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> Satish would like to make a comment about promoting no, I, I planetary well-being. Wonderful what um, Lynn has said is absolutely I 100% agree, uh, but dream, in order to dream, you have to go to sleep. <laughs> and you have to reduce your activities because for dream is a subconscious level. 
if you are all the time alert and active in business and government and economics and politics and so on, you cannot dream because you are too busy on your uh, uh, conscious level. So in order to access your subconscious, you have to slow down, you have to rest and you have to meditate. And when you're in meditation and you're mindful of your being at a deeper level, then you can dream. And so my simple, I mean, everything I agree with what Lynn has said, but my simple answer to the person is coming from India. And I think uh, this person will understand that you have to meditate and, and take time, go out in the mountains or go by the river Ganges somewhere where world is left behind to have a big dream and then come back in the world, wake up in the morning and then act on your dream. Remember the dream and act on your dream and realize your dream. Martin Luther King had a dream in prison and out of prison he came and said, I have a dream, made a big speech at uh, Washington uh, uh, March. But that dream came to him when he was alone in prison. So Mahatma Gandhi had a dream in prison. So we have to slow down. We have to go to sleep, rest, and then your dream will come. Okay, thank you so much. So with these words, uh, I'm going to uh, express my gratitude to you, Satish, you, Lin, for being here with us, for sharing your thoughts, your experience, your reflections uh, with us. Uh, I think it has inspired um, many of us, all of us who are here today and who will be listening to the recordings of this conversation. Uh, I want to thank our audience uh, who have joined us uh, from different parts of the world uh, um, and, uh, and, and by inviting you to go for a walk <laughs> and rest and see the birds, the sky, the clouds, uh, just be mindful of the air we breathe, the food we drink, the water also that we drink and, and of course the food we, we eat and be grateful uh, in this Mother Earth and, and that uh, may we take the time to walk gently and may we take the time to see what we don't normally see in our busy days. And um, let me end by inviting you to, to take a look at the Earth Charter, I encourage you to incorporate it in your uh, work, in your spheres of action. Yeah, as an instrument that to amplify your worldviews, as an instrument to stimulate dialogue, and as an instrument to spark new action, and invite you to to take a look and, and join and get involved with the, the Earth Charter movement. Thank you, everybody, and happy Earth Day. Let's uh, roll up our leaves and work towards restoring our earth and restoring our relationship with earth. Thank you, Satish, and thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.